and this is Mercy of the Dragon. Yes, this one's about Vulcan. Ooh. But let's begin. The final book excerpt of tonight. The Mercy of the Dragon. Or just Mercy of the Dragon. The Gorgon grinned. An altogether ugly expression on such a grizzled face. He is ferocious, he said. His voice as gritty and as harsh as his appearance. His black armor was shorn to the bare ceramite in places, though the scorch marks caused by fire barely showed. The way you described him, I thought. You did not expect a warrior, said the Emperor, his glided panoply gleaming. He stood upon a blasted hillhock, not that he needed the vantage to look imposing. His stature and power spoke for themselves. Despite the battles, he remained pristine, as radiant and as terrifying as a nuclear sunrise. I expected a blacksmith, but he's a destroyer. Much of the outer lands beyond the major cities of Rankar had been reduced to ash. A bombardment lasting several days had softened up the native defenses, but had seen the same forces dug in instead of broken as the Emperor had hoped. The Imperial Assault, when it came, swept across all six continents as relentless as a hurricane. Still, the Ragnar, Ragnar whatever, had endured, bided out by their perverse fate, the reason for the Imperial's proclamation of extinction. And so, the Emperor had unleashed his dragon, and the lands had burned. Only then, so slowly swallowed by fire, had the Ranknar showed any sign of defeat. I thought the Wolf King had fury, said Ferus, admiring the choleric spirit of his newfound brother. This? Where did you find him? A death world, said the Emperor, his piercing gaze seeing more and raging farther than any other on both the battlefield and second battle line where he stood with his son, Ferus Manus, one consumed by fire. Ferus gave a snort of laughter. <laughs> they watched from the blasted hill lock. The troops and armored divisions are arrayed before them and ready for the Gorgon's command. His warriors, his iron hands, the dragon led a company of them, and several cohorts of army auxilia. The scent of engines and hot metal from the idling artillery and heavy battle tanks waffled over the mustering, but peered out and was swallowed up by the stink of sweat and death by the time it reached the battle less than a hundred meters away. Ferris folded his silver arms, recitative. They shimmered with an uncanny luster the metal of their forging, as miraculous as it was mysterious. A massive war hammer lay against one armored shoulder, a gift from Fulgrim, and one he desired to bloody again. For now, he would do as his father ordered. He would watch another dragon wreak havoc. Harry suspected it was not only his newfound brother who was being tested this day. Draconic in both aspect and temperament, he said, alluding to the savage scalped war plate worn by the dragon. You taught him much more of your craft, Ferris. Asked the Emperor. None, in truth. He needed no help in that regard. When I reached the forge, he was gone, and the armor with him. The Emperor smiled, as if pleased with his works. Your assessment? Overly flamboyant, but it appears to serve well. Him. Not his armor, Ferris. A raised eyebrow and a grunt of acknowledgement preceded the Gorgon's reply. Quite like a Medusan. A Medusan er worm. And they all like that where he where he came from. Are they all all yeah. This one is really getting to me. Are they all like that where he came from? No. He is unique. As are you. His silver fingers clenched and unclenched, without Ferris realizing. He nodded. He nodded. He's impressive, he admitted, then turned disdainful. 
but Rus and Horus, even Fulgrim, they match his prowess. I see nothing special about him. You will. The Emperor paused abruptly, and the Gorgon felt his hackles rise. They are opening the gates. Horus hid his unease at his father's use of free science, remaining bullish. Then they are as foolish as they are blind. Sort is insane. They don't know when they are beaten. Is any beast when cornered? They risk annihilation, said Ferus, as the gigantic city gates did indeed open. Desperate men perform desperate acts. I feel fear in them. A fearful enemy attacks without restraint. This will be costly for us. A rust red mist gathered around the opening, obscuring whatever was coming through. They're all soldiers and know the risk. Be wary of Probleefy Gacy, my son. Okay, what word is that? Probleefy Gacy, my son? Whatever. Life is not so cheap as you might think. The ruddy fog pattered, and what stood before the gate stopped the Gorgon's reply dead, his eyes widened. The ground shook, felt as far away as the second battle line. Her swung his warhammer into both hands. Now can we intervene? The Emperor had already drawn a glittering golden sword. Its edge burst into flames. Yes, now we can. His true quarry ranged ahead, possessed by an even greater fury, and about to charge the gates of the city on his own. When Ferris came upon the first of the felled statue engines and saw what, what its shattered chest cavity had harbored, he realized why. Blood of Astronaut felt the same pure rage well up inside him that had overtaken the dragon, a child laying dying in the carcass of the statue engine a withered wretched thing half drained of blood it was a bon um, abominable science a machine fueled by the blood of the living a parasitical engine fed children to give it animus upheld ferris almost missed the vox crack on his war helm it was a dragon bring down the gates he said drunk on wrath his voice a predatory snarl. Now, father. Ferris found the Emperor on the battlefield, only a short distance away. The Imperial army had closed ranks as the enemy fell back, consolidating to a position of strength, their Emperor inspiring the utmost discipline. If the self-proclaimed master of mankind felt anything at the dragon's words, it was no sign. He merely raised his flaming swords. Sword. Moments later, a concentrated barrage struck the main gate of the city, a blow so unearing that Ferus wondered if the Emperor had applied some of his strange craft to make it so. The gate split apart, the wall that held it rupturing and collapsing at the same time. Dust and smoke billowed outwards, clouding and outpouring of burned and shattered rock. It was a small breach, a crack in an otherwise sprawling face of rock but it was all Vulcan needed the dragon ran for the gap in the wall easily outpacing the few warriors still with him and killed everything in his path Ferris looked down sadly on the dying child and gave it mercy then he went after his brother to the dragon he roared to the warriors in his command Vox bo boosting his voice so that the very air trembled his brother had disappeared into the smoke-choked darkness just in front of the wall. He cannot fight an entire army, even a defeated one in win. The Emperor did not answer, and Ferris had no time to look to see if he had heard him. And then he saw the weapon, wheeled into a position on a great iron carriage. It had the look of a spire, tall, well, tall. Tall and ugly, barbs ran down a dark metal shaft that terminated in a narrow spike like an arrowhead. It protruded menacingly from behind the city's broken battlements, more dominant than any of its towers, 
in bleeding red miasma. Ferris knew its ilk, if not the specific design. Virus weapon. It was pointing straight up. The natives intended to saturate the atmosphere with a contagion, something wrought by the rancid blood signs. Father, now the Emperor spoke. I have seen it, my son. There's no time to draw that mis the mis that missile. I will do what I can to stop it. Reacting to the obvious threat, the Imperial artillery chain redoubled its efforts and unleashed repeated missile salvos against the city. The detonations marched the walls, blasting revenants, tearing the garrison apart, reaching towards the shattered gatehouse. Ferris did not slow. He would get to his brother. He would stop the virus missile from ever launching, or they would die together. He had about made peace with his potential death when the dragon's voice came over the Vox again. Hold your fire! Hold! Hold all the weapons! All weapons. His impassionate command reverberated, reaching enemies and allies alike. He stood before the breach, barely a meter away, though the through the suit and displaced earth made it impossible to see what had made him stop. It took a few seconds, but the steady barrage began to slow. Ferris kept running, possessed of an urgency that felt strange and unsettling. Concern for a brother he had never met. A grey cloud briefly obscured his vision before it passed and he saw him again, his mysterious brother, charging the breach. The last missile fell, already on its dead path, and too late to be recalled or brought down. It struck the gatehouse. It struck the breach. Father! Ferris cried out, surprised at his sudden dismay. His legionaries turned aghast to where fire and destruction had shattered the gatehouse. Men in the Imperial Army ranks slumped, stunted. No one had seen a Primarch fall before. Most believed they were immortal. Nothing could survive, Her whispered Ferris, trying to disbelieve the evidence of his own senses. Father, is he? He asked louder. The Emperor said nothing, as an anxious silence stole over the battlefield. The, the fighting had stopped. Wait, a wary voice came across the Vox and through the parting smoke across embers of burning wood and stone still flickering at his leaden feet emerged the dragon. He had lost his war helm, and one shoulder guard hung by a ragged thread. There was blood. His own. A crack split his breastplate. He held his left arm close to his body. Ferris stopped a meter away. You live? Though I cannot fathom how, he said and I, the onyx-skinned giant, would weary respect. It must be tougher than I look. Ferris gave a short, mirthless laugh. You look tough, brother. His eyes narrowed, heightened senses still alert to any sudden threat. You bled for them. Why? The onyx giant smiled, and he moved his arm away, to reveal a child laying in his grasp. Little more than a babe, terrified, but breathing. His red eyes flare like hot coals, diabolic, yet warm. It was the first of many contradictions that Ferris would come to learn about his brother. He lives too, he said, and I bleed for life, for innocence. She is not alone. There are others. This war is over. As they saw the dragon cradling the child, the warriors of the city lost their taste for blood and laid down their weapons. Then, with the smoke yet to dissipate and the fires of battle still burning, the emperor came forth and gave his edicts. He promised clemency for the natives and the rule of the Imperium. He promised truth and shared of his dream for mankind's, mankind's preeminence among the stars. Sarda had listened dumbly to the words of the Golden Lord and recalled them dimly as he trampled abroad the transport. He 
He was bound for a ship that would take him and his kind to another world, to other colonies. He did not spare a glance for the corpse hanging from the battlements. Vidus could rot for all it mattered now. He had seen the dragon's selfless act. Witnessing a sacrifice that gave the world the word fresh meaning in his eyes. Mercy. They had all seen it. He chooses to remember it. And he had heard his name spoken amongst the Imperials. Not a dragon. Not a beast. But a legend all the same. They called him Vulcan. <laughs>